Hi, Kat here for Lightwave Digital. Let's say you've just picked up Lightwave 2033 and you want to try to make a nuclear explosion using Turbulence FD. Well, a number of years ago, I made a couple of interesting packs. One was the nuclear weapons pack, and then another one was conventional weapons pack. And I hope to continue on those series very shortly. But in the meantime, here's an example of what you can do with the product as it stands with no real issues whatsoever. This is going to be very simple for anybody to go and put together themselves. In my scene here, nothing super complicated. Um, we have a very large grid. It's roughly 10 meters per little square so 10 meters so each one of these large ones represents 100 meters so if you count them it's one two three four five roughly this one is about four and a half four and a little bit across in terms of the um turbulence ft volume and as you can see uh it's about 370 meters 950 meters so we've got the column for the nuclear blast that's going to go in here and the z-axis is about 340 meters not wasting any you know space um, whatsoever to make sure that this works on not my lovely 10 um, uh, or my uh, RTX 460 Ti, but back when I started doing these kits, uh, GTX 980, which only had four gigabytes of RAM in terms of VRAM for memory storage. As I've mentioned before, and as it says in the Quick Time Guide or the um, Quick Start Guide for TFD, it's important that if you want to reduce the amount of time that it takes for you to do your simulations and make sure that they always fit, get the best graphics card that you possibly can in terms of memory space uh, on board and make sure you're saving your caches to a very, very spiffy M.2 drive or at least an SSD. I don't recommend doing it to a spinning disk. Uh, those will be extremely slow. Okay, so what do we got in here? This emitter that's in the center is not a piece of geometry. It's just a particle effects emitter, which is native to Lightwave. And that particle effects emitter is essentially right in the center of the origin, but it's offset from the ground a little bit. If you know how nuclear weapons work and how the blast radius works, uh, this will make sense to you. Uh, for those of you who don't, um, nuclear weapons generally are detonated uh, between 5,000 and 500 feet uh, above ground for maximum blast radius um, and decimation effect. And also it reduces the uh, risk of fallout because when they blow up, they consume all their nuclear fuel before contaminating anything else. Although um, gamma radiation is not fun. Um, the idea here is that the ground that's in here helps to push back and give us that mushroom cloud. Now, you'll notice that I don't actually have an, another emitter or a collision object in here other than just the detonation itself. So how is it bouncing back off off the ground? Well, in the simulation system under the solver, you can close different boundaries of your container. So I'm basically faking a ground by using close minus Y. And that gives us that collision directly off the container itself. I don't actually need a collision plane or something like that in here to do this for this particular effect. And it actually works better if you uh, can do it this way than uh, using a flat plane to bounce an explosion off of and let's say you need it specifically somewhere inside of the container and such as registering on ground because it will fill up all the way to the bottom of the container rather than requiring the plane to be slightly offset, giving the plane some thickness, and then having it simulate from there. So now that we've got this in here, let's take a look at what this emitter is actually doing. You hit P for properties, drag the emitter in for the window. I click it. Don't get too concerned by the amount of particle limit. This is just something I did to make sure that I always had particles when I was setting up scenes for this. But let's take a look at what this particle emitter is. It's two meters wide by one meter tall by two meters um, deep. And the reason why it's elongated like that is to give that initial particle blast a shape. Let's go just directly to wireframe mode for a moment. You can see all those particles in there. A lot of particles. And this was kind of overkill, but it was a demonstration for a client as to how this can be done. Because these particles, I don't really need them to be this many. I could reduce the amount of particles per frame very easily and just increase their radius. Because the container itself is using a voxel size of 2.2 meters. 
and again the reason for this was largely I couldn't fit this into a 980 uh, graphics card, a GTX 980. So it had limited amount of RAM and I really couldn't fit it in there without um, pushing the very limits of it and having it um, uh, stop and you know I'd have to simulate it on the uh, processor instead, which would take a very long time. Well, because we've got this RTX 480 or 460 Ti, it has 16 gigabytes of RAM on board. I can easily crank this up and let it rip, but that will take some time, and we've only got a few minutes to do these little videos with you. So let's take a look at what else is going on here. This particle property is randomizing particles based off of size, and it's an intensity value that's controlled through a function curve. If you want to know about more function curves, they are uh, documented quite well on the Quick Start Guide on the LightWave3D.com website. You can go and check out those. So at any rate, we're going to randomize these particles up to a maximum of 25% using this function curve. And we'll just you know, top this off a little bit. And then we'll do another resim once we've got the rest of that set. And under here, each of these particles is basically being told to represent themselves as spheres to TFD when it solves it. So we're going to take those spheres and we're going to give them some volume texture, a little bit of uh, texture octave value that's higher than default. Defaults are normally one, um, and the texture contrast is one. The volume speed is also something I could probably crank up here because um, this is a very, very fast detonation. Um, we want this to run through these values very, very quickly over that kind of scale. Um, but again, because they're all randomized in particles, it's all going to pretty much fill up and just turn into a big poof right off the bat. Under the force, we've got a value here. Um, the directional force, we're going to push all this stuff down when it emits, and we've got pressure of 500 starting off at the start and then falling off almost immediately. And I don't even really need this all the way out, but... Um, this was set up for other detonations and explosions, so I can leave those by default, and you'll see why. We don't need these burn mode or fuel intensity modes, we just need temperature. So we're going to emit a huge amount of temperature units right off the top, and then we're going to fall off so that by frame 50, we're basically down to zero. Same thing with density, but we're going to start with zero being emitted and we ramp up to 300 by frame 9. So that, like, we've got that intense fireball and then everything becomes you know, filled with smoke. So we can probably tighten this up a little bit. A little bit less. And we'll start it like three frames in. Two frames, there we go. Okay, now that I've got that set, most of the work that's going to be done in here is going to be done through pressure. So let's make sure that we've got some subframe steps because this is a very high speed uh, detonation. So we're going to go, um, let's go three frame, subframe steps and then pressure iteration five. And we'll take a look at what this does for us. Okay, so I'm going to back away from this so we can see the simulation taking place. So you can see that the, in the initial setup, these particles were only this big, and almost all of the effort to get it expanding that fast was done through the force and the pressure. Okay, let's pull some of these windows out of the way here, and we'll back away, and we'll hit start for simulation. Do you notice that it was very slow at the start there? That's because it's trying to calculate the pressure solver. And once that initial burst is over, it becomes much easier for it to figure out where everything is supposed to be. So it'll actually speed the simulation up, even though we're consuming more data. The math is easier for it to do. I'm going to only let this go to about 150 frames because I think we kind of get the point that this thing is, you know, a big freaking mushroom cloud. All right, so that's probably pretty good. 
Let's take a look at it through the camera. And we'll do a quick preview here. Just to see how it moves. Okay, not bad. All right, and of course, you know, when you take a look at something like this, we're only looking at it through OpenGL with the preview for the density channel with the smoke shader. So it's not going to look super impressive. And also keep in mind that, you know, any type of nuclear blast is going to cause a massive, you know, bright flash. And that would be something you could add in post or use a lightweight lens flare uh, just to help out that initial blast so that it doesn't look a little chewy. But once you get to this point, um, you know, you're pretty much golden and you're going to see detonation as it would take place. So let's take a look at what other settings we have here. This was, again, uh, a setting that I used to just render this stuff out. So this was voxelized fast. There are three modes to this other than none. Voxelized fast, voxelized smooth, and then accurate. Accurate is a uh, interesting um, setup. It is discussed in the quick start guide, so check that out. For right now, we're just going to use uh, voxelized fast, and that will help keep the render time really, really low. So let's do a really quick F9 here and see what this looks like. It's very yellow, very bright, which isn't totally unheard of in a nuclear blast from this range. And the further down the animation you go, it's going to be cooling off. And we're going to start to see the fireball column, the mushroom cloud itself. These bits are still very, very intense which is what Castle Bravo looked like. It's it's ridiculous what that thing was. And all of a sudden you're um, Oppenheimer. Okay, so uh, these values that are very white and bright hot, of course, as I've mentioned before, are controllable. All of them are controllable via envelopes. And this is a really good example of why you can control these things via envelopes and they're just not left to default and there's nothing you can do with it. It's because you can change the high and low temperatures of these things. So it's like, this is going to be 5,000 degrees Kelvin and then we're going to drop it down or whatever it might be in temperature um, in centigrade or um, I believe it's Kelvin in uh, TFD. But um, the temperature being that high and then dropping it down, and we have a white point and a damping point, so that it's really, really, really bright. And we drop those temperatures down over a gradient or a curve. And there's also the fact that we can change the fire smoothing. And the fire smoothing is actually very important because um, it works in conjunction with the smoke smoothing. So that right off the bat, when that initial blast takes place, you're going to get a lot of this soft kind of poof and this is controlled by the smoke smoothing okay so we're just going to turn it to zero really quickly you'll see the difference turn the density smoothing off as well you can see how much it changes the outer edge so there's the first frame. Oops. So there's the first frame. I turn the smoke smoothing down and then with the smoke capacity off. Okay, so at this particular frame, it's not as easy to see. You have to go down a little bit more, but it really helps to um, take the, uh, the chunkiness off if you do encounter it. And of course, this can also be controlled via envelopes. Okay, let's scrub down a little bit here. We 
We can, of course, change our smoke color. Let's pull that down. It's a very, very bright smoke. Okay, renders very, very quickly. Um, yes, it's a little bit canary yellow in some spots, and it's very, very bright here. If we take a look at our values, it's going to be way off the scales. But you know what? It's it's where it's supposed to be for this kind of blast. That's what it actually would look like. Um, but there's a little bit of noise in here. We can see it present in some of these spots. So how do you control that? Well, Lightwaves Renderer does a fantastic job of cleaning this up. Just a couple of uh, anti-aliasing steps and enabling motion blur uh, really works for it. But in order to really take advantage of that, if this isn't already turned on by default when you start your scene, make sure that this is actually enabled if you're running into this problem. See this noise threshold? This noise threshold, basically, the lower you go, um, the more attention is going to pay to noise. The higher the value, the less attention is going to pay to noise. Um, but it also helps really a lot if you have fluidic motion blur and you can clean this up because we do have the velocity cache, it's going to do a motion blur um, calculation, the camera's moving, and it's going to look that much better. So there's the initial pass, and now we get the motion blur on top of it, and you can see that it cleans it up, and really the change in render time is quite insignificant. Four seconds for that improved look. can see the change in the shift and that shift is the motion blur working take a look at the alpha channel you can see that it's quite present we've got darkness there's a bit of breakup in the top there so it's in the composite really nicely let's go further down the line here and let's back this camera up a little bit see what this thing looks like in all of its glory Go zero on the Y there. Do another test render. still see the smoke of the column but a lot of this is really about that fireball at any point in time if you want to put um, an actual collision object in here or have a plane fly through this or something like that you can most certainly do that by just adding it as a emitter and then setting it to collision uh, be careful to keep it low polygon so it'll simulate faster But you should have no problems being able to stuff just about anything into the scene to simulate it as an interactive effect on this. All right, well, that's it for just this explosion. Um, this is going to be provided to you as content on Lightwave Digital a, um, Facebook group, and it'll also be part of the content downloads for the next update of Lightwave 3D. All right, thank you very much. We'll talk to you again soon.